Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Let's look at Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. The story that we call the prodigal son. Verse 11 says, And there was a man, a certain man, who had two sons, and the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me. Now, if, if you have no problem with writing in your Bible, I would like you, if you have a pen in your hand, to draw a circle around, give me. Father, give me the part of the property that falls to me. And, divide, and so the father did, and he divided the estate between the two sons. And not many days after that, the younger son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country, and there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. Now, you know, I wonder sometimes, well, I don't wonder because I really know why he did it, but it's interesting to me that the, father, that the son asked for what he really had no business having, what he really was not mature enough to handle, and yet the father gave it to him. And I think it's because that was the only way the young man was going to learn his lesson. Have you ever just begged God for something and he finally gave it to you, and after he did, you thought, man, this ain't what I wanted at all. <laughs> I thought I wanted this, but this just is not working out. I wish I would have let God make the choice and said, God, you give me what you want me to have. Amen? Verse 14, and when he had spent all that he had, a, a mighty famine came upon the country, and he began to fall behind and be in want. So he went and he forced and he glued himself upon one of the citizens of that country who sent him out in his fields to feed the hogs. <laughs> And he would gladly have fed on and filled his belly with the carob pods that the hogs were eating, but they could not satisfy his hunger, and nobody gave him anything any better. Then when he came to himself, I love that, he came to himself. <laughs> uh, let's have a come to self gathering. <laughs> How many more nights do you want to spend with the frogs? How many more pig pens do you want to live in? You say, what's with the frogs? Well, when the plagues were coming on Egypt, one of them was frogs. They had frogs everywhere. There was frogs in the bread basket, frogs in the oven, frogs in the driveway, frogs in the palace, frogs in their beds. I mean, the Bible is explicit about all the places where the frogs were. Everywhere. Frogs, 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 frogs. And so Pharaoh said, you got to get rid of these frogs, Moses. Get rid of the frogs, and I'll let the people go. And Moses said, when do you want me to pray for you? I will pray, and the frogs will leave. When do you want me to pray? And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. <laughs> Now I ask you, why would anybody want to spend one more night with the frogs? If you could get rid of them tonight, why would you want to sleep with them one more night? Is anybody tired of living with frogs? Whatever your frog is, you can name it. I know what it's like to live in the pig pen of life. When I think about what God has done in my life, oh gosh, oh Lord have mercy. How many of you feel the same way? My, 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 my. I cannot fathom what it would be like to be in the world that we have today and not know Jesus. I mean, that would just be an absolute nightmare. So then he came to himself, verse 17. And he said, how many hired servants of my father have enough food and even food to spare But I'm perishing, dying here of hunger. I am going to get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now just make me. Draw a circle around, make me. Because see, you're going to miss this whole thing if you don't pay attention to these two phrases. Make me like one of your hired servants. 
So he got up and he came to his father, who while the young man was still a long way off, saw him coming, prepared a feast, prepared a robe, got sand to his father's feet, got him a great ring, planned a big party, and was so glad to have him back. But he went from give me through the pig pen to make me one of your servants. Give me, give me my money. Give me what I want. Don't even ask God to, you know, just say, God, you give me, this is what I think I want, God, but you give me what you know I'm ready to handle. You don't ever have to worry. God's not going to hold out on you. I want this ministry to be however big it can be and me still stay sane and keep God first in my life. I don't want anything that's going to take me away from God. And believe me, sometimes we can pray for things and then those very things can take us away from God because we start paying more attention to them than we do God. It's like a married couple, they have a child and now all of a sudden the mother forgets the husband, and all she cares about is the child. Well, I can guarantee you he's not going to want her to have any more babies. <laughs> and that's why God checks us out a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. I've been at this 37 years. I didn't just wake up one morning and roll out of bed and have this huge ministry. God checks you out in levels and degrees. And if you can be faithful here over a little... Then he'll make you the ruler over a little bit more. And then you're faithful there for a while. And then you're ruler over a little bit more. He went from give me to make me, but it took a circumstance. Come on now. To get him there. You know, I believe that we are pregnant with God's nature. We're literally pregnant with God's nature. Now, I need a little help if I can get it. Do we have any pregnant ladies here today? If you're pregnant, lift your hand up. Come on, if you're pregnant, nice and high, lift your hand up. Okay, uh, I need, okay, I need somebody that's just barely pregnant. You're just, you're not even really showing yet. Come on, be bold, come and help me. Come on, if you're barely pregnant, I won't make you say anything. Yeah, I, and I need you. I need somebody that's like ready to deliver any minute. We got anybody that's like... Do we have anybody that's just like so pregnant you're about to pop? <laughs> Come on, anybody? Stuff a pillow under your shirt or something. Yeah, oh, you'll do. Come on, you are wonderful. Yes, bring them up here. Bring them up here. Come on. All right, you guys are doing good. All right, now here, just stand right here and turn your belly toward the crowd. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to work you around a little bit. Come here, this is good. Okay, oh, yeah, this this will work. Come here, right here. Right here, right there. Ooh, ooh. Would you take the shirt off? I can't. Okay, now. All right, now look. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 John 3, 9, that when we're born again, the divine sperm of God comes into us, bringing us the nature of God. Let's look at 1 John 3, 9, while they just stand there and look cute for a minute. <laughs> Please look at this. No one begotten of God, deliberately knowing it and habitually practices sin. It doesn't say that you don't sin. It says you don't live in sin. Why? Because God's nature abides in him. His principle of life, the divine sperm, Jesus is the divine sperm or the seed of Almighty God. And when we're born again, that seed, if you will, is planted in the womb of our spirit. No different than the seed of these girls' husbands were planted in their wombs, and they are now pregnant with the baby's father's child. Now, look. Now, just hang on. I mean, you, you'd never know she was pregnant. No. Th this is what we're like when we're first born again. <laughs> It's like, yeah, you what? <laughs> well, well you, don't, you don't look any different to me. You sure don't look pregnant. But she knows she's pregnant, and she's excited about being pregnant, and she's already making plans for the baby that nobody else even believes yet that she's going to have. 
okay? Now, you stick with it a little while, and then pretty soon you start to show a little bit. And some of you have been hanging out with Jesus long enough, now you're starting to show a little bit. <laughs> Come on, I love this example. You're, it, it, you're kind of like, I mean, people are saying, well, you know, maybe something is a little different with you. Yeah, you're, you're not quite like you used to be. Hang out a little bit longer, and then, man, you're like, yeah, you're really starting to show. They're like, wow, there's something different. Yeah, something has happened to you. Hmm. Wow. Now, I happen to be a woman who carried all my babies 10 months. Yes, I'm not prophesying that on you, sweetheart. When is your baby due? July 22nd. July 22nd, okay, so, but we're just gonna pretend for a minute that she's overdue. That, that it, she's, she's, been, she's been due, and now she's overdue. And so, the longer you stay pregnant, the more uncomfortable you get. And you finally just, come on, help, walk with me and help me. You finally just kinda get to the point where you're just like, and you're thinking, oh my God, if I don't have this baby pretty soon, I don't think I can stand it, amen? Yeah, she's like, she said wheelchair, that's right. So, now here's what I think. I think people in the body of Christ at large are pregnant and overdue. <laughs> you say, what do you mean? I believe that we have been pregnant with the nature of God long enough, and now it is time to bear down and give birth and start walking in love so the world can see what we have. Thank you, girls. Thank you. Now, let me tell you, when I carried my babies 10 months, I was not a happy camper. And can I tell you something that is just ridiculous? There are so many unhappy Christians. What does a Christian have to be unhappy about? You're not going to hell. <laughs> no matter what's going on in your life, you have hope of change. No matter how many times you mess up, God is always there to give you a fresh start. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I will provide for you. I will help you. I will give you my power. You're already justified, redeemed, made right, seated in heavenly places with Christ. What do we have to be unhappy about? Well, my circumstances. <laughs> well, why don't you just try this? You know, God, this hurts so bad, and <laughs> I really wish it wasn't going on. I don't get it, but I'm going to trust you that you're going to remove this when the time is right, and until then, God, just use it to do something wonderful in me. Let's just get some value out of this if we can while we're going through it. And you know, God doesn't have to bring something into your life in order for you to get value out of it while you're going through it. I'm not saying that God brings a bunch of bad stuff into our life. I do believe there are times when God puts us places that we'd rather not be and he puts us with people that we'd rather not be with. You know, don't pray to love the unlovely if you don't want to be around anybody unlovely. Don't pray to be used by God and then cut crab because you're the only Christian in the place. <laughs> Just imagine if a woman is in labor and she keeps holding back. The pain's only going to get worse. And what do they tell you? Relax, breathe, <laughs> push. And you just want to give the doctor a black eye. It's like. <laughs> but just imagine if you just kept holding back and holding back. And I think that's what we do as people. I think many times the thing that we know that God wants from us, we, 
We think it's going to cost us. It's going to take an effort. It, it's going to mess up something in our plan. And so rather than just totally surrendering ourselves to God and submitting ourselves to him and his plan, we hold back and we hold back. So we got all this big Jesus inside of us and we go to church every week. We get a little more word. We get a little bit more fatter and pregnant, 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 pregnant. And so then we just sit on the church pews and grumble and complain about everything that's going on around us. And it's, it's only because we're not giving birth to what God has put in us. All the men get to be pregnant today. I believe that we're pregnant with love. And you know, love is, is, love is seen in many, many, many different ways. I made a list here, but it's like, love is seen in being patient with people, bearing with the failures of the weak, being an excellent person, we're showing love when we go the extra mile instead of just doing what we absolutely have to do to get by. It's doing unto others what you want them to do to you. Love is kindness. It's forgiveness. It's helping people. It's giving time. It's listening. It's giving a compliment. It's providing for someone, praying for someone, being faithful, being committed, believing the best. And I could just have pages and pages and pages of the qualities of love. I believe that love is inclusive, it is not exclusive. Love doesn't just love people that are like, we can't just love people that are like us. You know, God talked a lot in the Bible about how to treat strangers, which I think is interesting. I mean, there were some Old Testament laws about how to treat strangers. They were commanded by the law of Moses to bring in the strangers and to make them feel welcome. Well, naturally, we're all more comfortable with people we know that are like us. But the best thing to do in church is not just get in your little cliquish group. <laughs> but keep your eyes open for somebody that you don't know or somebody who looks maybe a little lost or uncomfortable and go to them. It's not my favorite thing to do either. But it's what God told us to do. And so that's what we need to do. Amen? Amen? Now, some of you are real good at that. I mean, Pastor Mike, who's been helping us, he'd have no problem at all, you know, making friends with everybody that he'd never seen before. My husband wouldn't have any problem with it. I'd, I'd have to do it on purpose, but that's okay. <laughs> that's what I'm telling you, that, you know, we don't just get to do what we're comfortable with. We do what God tells us to do. So I'm going to read you a story out of my book. It's a story about me. And I think you'll get my point. I believe we need to broaden our circles of inclusion. And we need to make them wide enough to include all kinds of people. I was recently with a pastor from England. And we were having coffee in a coffee shop with several other people. And I remember looking at the hairstyle of the girl who was waiting on us, and to be honest, it was the absolute strangest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> her head was shaved except for one row of hair going down the middle of her head that was standing straight up and was red, black, blue, and white. She also had her nose, her tongue, her lip, and several other places on her ears pierced. And I remember feeling a bit uncomfortable because she was not anything like I was. <laughs> we were so different that I could not even think of anything to say to her that she might even remotely relate to. So I just wanted to order my coffee and try not to stare. <laughs> Anybody ever been there and done that? <laughs> it's interesting how uncomfortable we get around people that aren't like us. Paul, on the other hand, the pastor I was with, started up a conversation with the girl. And the first thing he said to her was, I like your hair. How do you get it to stand up like that? <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, man, don't offend her. <laughs> she answered him back, and they were laughing. And he continued the discussion with her, and the air began to lighten up. Everybody got relaxed, and soon we were all at ease, and I could feel that we were all starting to join in their conversation. 
and include her in our circle. I learned a huge lesson that day that I'm not quite as modern as I might like to think that I am. And I still have some stinking religious thinking <laughs> that needs to be dealt with. And I need to go to a new level of making all people, including those who are different from me, feel comfortable and included. Amen? What about you? You know, every generation always gossips about the younger generation coming up under them. I remember some of the goofy things that we did when I was a teenager. I mean, just, just silly things. Girls back then would wear a headscarf and tie it in a knot and put the knot up here on their chin. What's with that? Makes no sense. And you know what I've learned? God, believe it or not, actually anoints denim, not just polyester. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I thought the only way you could be godly was if you wore a three-piece suit and, you know, full everything to church. And then I started noticing how anointed some of these young people are and what God's doing through them and, and the, the praise and worship they're bringing and, and the, how the Spirit comes in. And so I've just come to the point, I don't really care if they don't dress like me. I don't care if their hairstyle is not like mine. You know what, you want to know the truth? When Moses came down off Mount Sinai after 40 days and nights, and he came down with those Ten Commandments, I bet none of us would have wanted to have coffee with him either. Because I bet there was, he was not looking all that great. And not only that, there's not one of us that would have hung out with John the Baptist. Because he looked like a wild man and ate locusts and honey and lived out in the woods. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're like, I'm not hanging out with you, buddy. <laughs> Come on, you get. <sighs> you only have one life. What are you going to do with it? The choice is yours. Are you going to keep it, give it for something useless, or give it to God? You know, there's really no one that's beyond God's reach. And no matter how bad you've been broken, wounded, and bruised, or how messed up your life may have been, God can heal you, and He can use you to help other people. When you surrender to God in this way, you can begin to let His love flow through you and it can make a huge difference not only in your life but in the lives of many people around you. You know, that's when life gets exciting. Not when you're living to just take care of yourself, but when you learn to live to love other people. Together, we are providing desperately needed medical care. We're feeding hungry children. We're giving homes to orphans. And you and I, with God's help, are doing more than we could ever do on our own. We are Joyce Meyer Ministries' Hand of Hope, and we appreciate you for being a part of it. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner.